This is December the 18th, 2002. We are talking to Myron Holbert. Uh, as a, a note of exception related to the other oral histories that are on file with the Colorado River Board, uh, Myron Holbert provided uh, an extensive uh, written history to the board approximately three years ago. Uh, it's well over 100 pages and uh, deals with uh, the period of time when he worked primarily with the Colorado River Board of California. Uh, did not talk about his career with Metropolitan Water District following the Colorado River Board. Uh, the point of this introduction is to let any future researchers know that uh, in Myron's case, uh, that original uh, history done three years ago is included in this package, but it is not a component of this videotape because that history was not videotaped. It was only uh, transcribed from an audio tape. So Myron's uh, package, if you will, is a little different from anyone else's. So, Myron, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining this project uh, on behalf of the Colorado River Board and the Colorado River Association. And uh, I think what I'd like to do is more or less turn this over to you and, and have you start to the extent that we can do it chronologically, but, but don't, get, you know, don't worry about that if you happen to go somewhere else and, and we come back uh, uh, to some other project that may have uh, started in the interim. Uh, what I'd li how I'd like you to start is to uh, talk a little bit about your first uh, job uh, where issues regarding the Colorado River were important and uh, when that was and how you got there and, and uh, what did you do and what did other people do at that, at that job again with respect to the Colorado River. Well, actually uh, my first job uh, was with the Bureau of Reclamation for uh, three months and then as a junior engineer in, in October 1947 I joined the Colorado River Board and stayed with them for some three and a half years and then uh, later and went to after that to the uh, consultant firm of uh, Leeds Helen Jewett for 14 years and uh, <clears throat> Dal Cole who was a chief engineer for a number of years uh, he and I maintained a relationship and he always wanted me to come back uh, to the Colorado River Board and then he contacted me uh, at one time in, in 1965 and told me that uh, he planned to retire in two and a half years and uh, he would like to see me as the next chief engineer and executive director of, of the Colorado River Board. And, um, that time I was a junior partner with the firm, but uh, <clears throat> they had moved to their headquarters, which had been in L.A. since 1906. Uh, they moved it to San Francisco for personal reasons. Uh, the, uh, actually, the, the head of the organization married a one, one woman who wanted to live in San Francisco, and I thought that was a bad move, uh, although another fellow and I continued to run the L.A. office. but. That, with the idea of looking forward to being chief engineer, I left the firm and uh, joined and <clears throat> in, all, I guess it was around August of 65, uh, possibly a little earlier. And my first day on the job was to fly to Washington because the hearings were starting on the what later became the Colorado River, River Basin Project Act. So my first day in the job consists of two weeks in Washington uh, at the hearings. And Dal Cole felt it was important for me to go to get on top of what was happening and to meet all the players, the representatives of uh, the other six Colorado River Basin states, as well as the key uh, federal officials. So that was an unusual start of a job, just to get on a plane, fly to Washington, and attend the hearings. And <clears throat> those um, hearings lasted a long time. Uh, we negotiated. I moved my, I was spending so much time on it that uh, Bob Will in the summer of 1966 uh, suggested that I move to Washington for the summer and use his offices. And uh, because I was flying to Washington every once every couple weeks for several days at a time. 
So we moved, I moved my whole family there and we spent most of the summer in Washington. And that was a big plus because I got to know many legislators on a one-to-one -one basis that I didn't know that well before. They, they'd always tell me uh, Craig Hosmer, who was a congressman, Biz Johnson, who was later uh, chairman of the uh, subcommittee of the Interior and Civil Affairs Committee. He was from Northern California. They always told me where they met for breakfast, where they ate, would eat breakfast, and said, invited me to meet with them at any uh, point in time. And also there was John Tunney, who was on the committee. There were five Californians on that subcommittee that heard the Colorado River Basin project bill. And it was later became a senator, and Ed Reinecke, who later became lieutenant governor. And uh, Phil Burton. Uh, from Northern California. So that was the delegation that was on this committee. Uh, could, could you give us a sense of what the negotiations were about and what was the significance of the act? Okay, basically <clears throat> the act started as the uh, Central Arizona Project Act. Arizona had uh, won the lawsuit and, uh, this is Arizona v. California. Right, and the Bureau of Reclamation had held up any action until that lawsuit, which took some 12 or 14 years to be completed, uh, would not take any action until the lawsuit was decided, and basically it was decided. So Arizona introduced that bill, and the bill went before the uh, Interior Incident Affairs on the House side that was chaired by Wayne Aspinall from Colorado. And he used this one, this bill, as a vehicle for Colorado projects. Then Wyoming got in, New Mexico, and they had some projects that they wanted involved. So it became a, a seven basin, seven state uh, enterprise with uh, lots of varying interests. And so that was the bill that was being heard on the House side. Okay. The bill started out originally as a mechanism to get federal funding for the Central Arizona Project. Yes. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. And that o over the course of negotiations, it, it became much larger than that. Right. And, um, and so it started in the summer of 1965 by the... Uh, Summer of '66, we had some agreement. And then we broke apart, uh, and it took some time to put things back together. The key issue, as far as California was concerned, was that we wanted priority over the Central Arizona project for California's basic 4.4 million acre feet per year in the event of any shortages. The Supreme Court had decided on the allocation to the three states, but it did not decide how the shortages should be handled. The special master that was appointed by the Supreme Court to uh, hear all the testimony over this 12-year period presented his report to the Supreme Court, and his recommendation was that shortage be shared in proportion to the allocations. So there were seven and a half million acre feet per year to be divided on a normal basis, with 4.4 .4 million to California, 2.8 million to Arizona, 300,000 for Nevada. And we were unhappy with that shortest provision. The Supreme Court did not accept the special master's uh, opinion on that. They instead left it up to the Secretary of Interior at such time that he deemed necessary to make a decision on that. When you say the Supreme Court, you're now making reference to the Arizona v. California lawsuit. Right. And uh, in terms of any litigation between states, the court of original jurisdiction is the United States Supreme Court. And they always set, uh, turn it over to the, a prominent attorney uh, to be the special master. And uh, so what we wanted was that we would uh, support the bill if we got priority over Arizona, uh, over the Central Arizona project. That was our key issue. Uh, 
uh, Arizona wanted the project, the other states have their projects. Um, it is correct, or, or correct me if I'm wrong, California originally opposed uh, the Central Arizona project, and I don't know to what extent you were engaged in water issues at that time. And then as the act that you're making reference to uh, became law eventually, California supported uh, Arizona in its attempt to get funding. Is that, is that a fair characterization? Once we finally arrived at an agreement, uh, then we did that. And uh, I came up with the language that Arizona finally uh, agreed with. And basically, what it said, it gave us the priority over them, and it gave the uh, Secretary of Interior, the United States, uh, the obligation to provide a supplemental water supply for the Colorado River equal to the amount of the Mexican Water Treaty. And that was a thing that allowed Arizona to go back to their people and say that well, we are giving California this priority in the event of shortages, but we're going to have some kind of future project that would bring more water into the river. Uh, of course, that, ha that never happened, or hasn't happened to date. Uh, but that, that was <clears throat> the way we finally solved the, the deadlock. But the, but the language that you helped negotiate and indeed uh, wrote, or partially wrote, maintains to this day, is that that's right. That was in the major. That was in the legislation. Uh, after you finished that, uh, to the extent that something that large can be finished, uh, you obviously moved back to California from Washington D.C. I just spent the summer. I, I went back uh, after that summer. Yeah. Okay. What was the next uh, item on the plate of the Colorado River Board after, after that issue was resolved? Well, <clears throat> one of the provisions of the Act uh, provided that. The, um, there, there be a, a, fi a, a development of principles of how you share the ship of storage, how you operate the reservoirs, starting with the upper basin reservoirs, primarily Glen Canyon Dam, and the lower basin reservoirs. Uh, to simplify it, the upper basin states and Arizona would want, like to keep the water levels as high as possible. The upper basin states wanted to be able to have sufficient water at all times to deliver their obligation to the lower basin states without them suffering any shortages. But the other aspect of it is they depended on the power from Glen Canyon Dam. So they didn't want to get it so high that there'd be a lot of spill from Glen Canyon. Okay, and I'm sorry, you, you said that they who are you referring I'm to? I'm talking about the four upper basin states of New Mexico, Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah. Those four states. Uh, the lower basin states being Arizona, California, and Nevada. Arizona, <coughs> since they were the first to accept shortages for the Central Arizona project, also would like to see the reservoirs generally be on the high side. For California, we would like to see it somewhat lower so there not be any spills, so whether it be less shortages for us. So those are the broad parameters of what we were dealing with, um, with uh, the other basin states. And I think our involvement was, I think mo uh, most people credit me with changing California's approach to the other states, and instead of being one of opposition, one of trying to work out issues with them. See, we had opposed the Glen Canyon Dam, the construction of Glen Canyon Dam. We, California? California had, under, Ely, under the leadership of uh, Mike Ely, who was the uh, uh, special counsel for the Attorney General in the uh, lawsuit between Arizona v. California, and was a consultant to the uh, Colorado River Board and the Colorado River Association, which was essentially a uh, public relations organization formed by the six California uh, agencies that uh, 
uh, get water from the Colorado River. Ma majorly for, for, for water agencies, but initially uh, the two others, uh, the uh, Department of Water and Power and San Diego County had some initial rights which they turned, turned over to uh, Metropolitan Water District. Okay. And when you say Department of Water and Power, you, you're talking about the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so we're negotiating uh, the, the so, operation of the reservoir. That's so. right. So <clears throat> this was a major issue, and we went into it on, a, on an honest basis to negotiate agreement. And one change, uh, I think uh, I got it so that uh, the other states agreed that we, Colorado River Board of California, would provide a draft. The Bureau of Reclamation had already provided a draft. Normally, the other states relied upon the Bureau to uh, handle this sort of thing, provide the draft, and, and uh, the other states would work for that. And in this case, they accepted our draft to be the working paper to uh, go from. And that had been my philosophy ever since I got there, that uh, on any issue I could, I would like our staff to do the work. The other states were small, uh, and, uh, for the most part, and their water agencies had responsibilities for the entire state. Ours was focused on the Colorado River, and we had a competent staff that could do work, and then they, not that they would accept it totally, but that was the basis of the discussions. Okay, and the, uh, as the, uh, we'll call them reservoir operating criteria for lack of a better word, as they developed and were finalized, uh, California was ultimately uh, satisfied with, yes, with we the were, resolution? Yes, we were satisfied, and they called, uh, the scheme called for a review every five years recognizing that there would be changes. And then there would be <clears throat> meetings at that time, and they would discuss whether or not to make any changes or stay with the current agreement. I should have asked this before. Uh, I'll ask it now. When you uh, began working for the Colorado River Board, and, and you described your uh, first couple of uh, months as you know, you're, you're back in D.C., uh, had you had experience with Colorado River issues prior to that uh, within your private consulting or, uh, yeah, private consulting, or was the Colorado River more or less new to you as a, as a water source, as a point of uh, discussion among basin states? I mean, how much of that were you aware of when you took the job? Well, I spent my first three years as a junior engineer and then later an assistant engineer with the Colorado River Board, so I had basic experience Going back then, then I was 14 years with the consulting firm, Leeds Hill and Jewett, and... Um, but after that 14-year uh, interim period, uh, I, I don't know what you were working on as yeah. a private consultant. When you got back to the board uh, after that 14-year period, was it kind of like riding a bicycle and, and, yeah. and everything was sort of the same, or had things changed significantly? No, <clears throat> there, were, there were a lot of change. I had a lot of the basic information in my head. But there were a lot of changes and I had to catch up on a, a number of things that happened, particularly the lawsuit. I made myself familiar with what had generally gone on in the lawsuit and uh, other things that uh, had happened uh, during that period. Uh, who would you say were the primary players in that lawsuit uh, at least on behalf of California, mm -hmm. unless your research also told you who they were with regard to Arizona. But I, I think someone reviewing this uh, manuscript or this videotape uh, 20 or 30 years from now would be interested in your thoughts about, and we don't have to go into detail about the people, but who were the people uh, that, that researchers might want to take a look at? Well, from the California side, uh, myself, and then there was Wes Steiner, who was the uh, Deputy Director of the Department of Water Resources when Bill Warren was the Director of Water Resources, uh, which was a period I was in, uh, they were there when I uh, started 
uh, the Colorado River Board in 1965. And then there was Don Maughan, who had the assistant chief engineer job that I took. Uh, he had left uh, to join the Department of Water Resources when they formed a new uh, Western States uh, section under West Steiner with the Colorado River Board. So when California met, generally there would be Don Maughan, Wes Steiner, and myself. And then Mike Ely, as the uh, consultant and attorney retained by the board, would be there. And then there would be the actual attorneys that are uh, assigned by the California Attorney General to the Colorado River Board. Initially, that was uh, Bert Gindler and Dave Stanton, later Carl Bronke, and uh, others, that, uh, Jane Goichman, uh, that were involved. So that was generally the California contingent. And then representatives from the major California agencies, the four Metropolitan, uh, Coachella uh, Water District, Imperial Irrigation District, and Palo Verde would have their representatives. But by and large, they relied on me to represent them. Uh, th that was the function of the Colorado River Board, to represent the agencies and to represent the state of California on Colorado River issues. It's probably worth noting for the record <clears throat> that Wes Steiner did not stay in California after this was over. That's right. <clears throat> what had happened is that uh, uh, Ronald Reagan was elected governor, and Pat Brown was defeated. Uh, and then uh, uh, Bill Ginelli uh, became the director of water resources, and uh, he demoted Wes Steiner. So he was no longer involved on the California side, just Don Juan was involved. So Wes then uh, took a position as executive director of the Arizona Water Commission, uh, which later became the Arizona Department of Water Resources, and he headed that. And he was a key player for Arizona once he was there. And then you had the key players from uh, the other states, uh, Don Paff representing Nevada, and you had uh, <coughs> Felix Sparks representing Colorado, and Steve Reynolds representing New Mexico, and Floyd Bishop representing uh, uh, Wyoming, and um, there was Dan Lawrence from Utah, but there was another individual whose name escapes me at the time. And then you have I Ivo Goslin, who was the executive director of the Upper Colorado River Commission. So those were the people involved. Uh, well, let's try and stay somewhat chronological here then and uh, move on to your next challenge at the Colorado River Board. Uh, after Arizona v. California is resolved, uh, the act is in place so Arizona can build the Central Arizona Project. Uh, the reservoir operation issue is more or less uh, taken care of. Uh, in, in sequence, what, uh, what next? Uh, well, I, I think the... Uh, Next thing was the salinity issue, the Colorado River salinity. Uh, uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, the river is uh, higher salt content than a lot of people would like uh, for different purposes. Also, it, although it's basically a, a good quality supply. But as you had more use in the upper basin, uh, you would get more higher saline water delivered to the lower basin, which could cost all the California uh, users uh, money and uh, in lots of different ways. Uh, so that started basically in a, in a way by virtue of the uh, Mexican, Mexican Water Treaty, the treaty between the United States and Mexico that divide the waters of the Colorado. And uh, basically that was divide, uh, decided in a 1944 treaty between the United States and Mexico, where Mexico was given the right to a million and a half acre feet a year. 
which is twice as much as they ever used before Hoover Dam was constructed. And one of the provisions in the construction of Hoover Dam was that uh, no foreign country should gain any benefit by virtue of construction of the dam. But as a practical matter, they did because the water was regulated and it allowed them to expand their uh, irrigation. And <clears throat> but the next event that happened was there was a project in uh, the lower Colorado River Basin called the Welton Mohawk Project in Arizona. And they were on <clears throat> the very lower end of the river. And they were had a project constructed by the Bureau of Rec Reclamation which pumped out some of the very salty water that was at a very high level in the lands that they formed in that area. This is highly saline groundwater that you're talking about now. Correct. Yeah, okay. okay, so they constructed the project and the water was discharged below the last American use, the diversion for the Imperial Irrigation District, and above the Mexican diversion points. And there was an immediate jump, significant jump, in the salinity of water delivered to Mexico. And that started negotiations between Mexico and the and United States. And <clears throat> there's a unique situation uh, on, the, uh, on that issue with respect to both countries. There was an International Water and Boundary Commission, and Mexico and the United States each uh, appointed commissioners who represented their State Departments on that uh, Joint International Boundary Water Commission. And one unique thing is that the commissioners had the rank of ambassador and they had to be engineers. And there are certain people, like the person who's interviewing me, who would say that's impossible for an engineer to be a diplomat. <laughs> But anyhow, that's what it was, and the guy who had the job for years was named Joe Friedkin. He was an engineer, and he was, he was a, a diplomat. He was able to last through several presidents and get reappointed each time. Could you, that's a name I'm not familiar with, Myron. Could you say that again just so we have Yeah, a Joe Friedkin. Joe Friedkin was his name. Thank you. Okay. So, <clears throat> The United States, through the Boundary Commission, had negotiated agreement with Mexico, and it was about to be signed about the time that the Mexican president, whose name I don't recall, uh, reached the end of his term. But he did not sign that agreement, which apparently was on his desk. For some reason, he didn't do it. And then the new president was invited by then President Nixon in the early 70s uh, to come and give a talk before a joint session of Congress. This was the first time in history that a um, Mexican president was so invited. And that to the amazement of everyone, he said the major issue between the United States and Mexico was the solution of this problem in Baja California, of the salinity of the Colorado River. What, what year would that have been? Well, I'm not certain as to the year, but it would have been 69, 70, 71, along that time. And. Um, State Department was stunned. They had the immigration problems, the drugs problem, foreign exchange problems with Mexico. So uh, they were very interested in solving this problem. And Nixon appointed Herb Brownell to be the United States representative on this issue. Herb Brownell was initially, uh, he was an attorney, New York attorney, that was campaign manager for President Eisenhower and later appointed by Eisenhower after he won the election to be 
Attorney General. After Eisenhower's term was up, he went back to private practice. So he uh, convened a meeting, uh, what's called the Committee of 14. And these were two representatives from each state appointed by the governors of the states uh, to advise on this issue. And myself and uh, the, um, at that time, it would have been Bill Gianelli, the Department of Water Resources uh, head, were the two California representatives. And the other states were represented by the people I earlier uh, designated from each state and with some, someone else along, alongside them. And we met with the federal officials and the uh, uh, state issues uh, to trying to come to some kind of U U.S. position, which we did, and then it was finally agreed to by the United States and uh, Mexico. And we were very important to Brownell because uh, that could have been an amendment to the original treaty, which would have required ratification by the Senate. And uh, with the 14 senators of the seven states, it wasn't going to pass unless they agreed to it. Because very few other senators would have been concerned. They would have let, it to, let the, these 14 senators decide whether it should be agreed to or not. The alternative was to consider it to be what they called a minute. That's how the uh, Boundary Commission operates. Every their, one of their decisions were, called, were numbered and called a minute. And we agree that it should be a minute, and we agree with what was finally resolved. So a minute or a minute item is uh, simply stated uh, an amendment to the treaty, but a little easier to accomplish than, uh, than uh, amending the treaty itself in a, in a more formal fashion. Right. In essence, that's what it did, but it was not called an amendment. It was called a minute. Okay. And it was an action that could be taken by the Bonding Commission. Okay. Uh, let me stop the tape for just one minute here, and we'll take a, a little break. Okay, we've restarted the tape uh, after a brief break. Myron, we were talking about the uh, Mexico salinity issue and uh, negotiations between the United States and Mexico over high salinity uh, Colorado River water going across the border after the Welton Mohawk project came online. And uh, where did you want to go with that? Well, uh, <clears throat> we resolved that issue, and the next thing was legislation by the United States to uh, authorize funds to build a, a desalting plant uh, close to the U.S.-Mexico border which would desalt the plant so that Mexico could essentially get water of the same salinity or similar, similar, fairly close salinity that was delivered in the United States to Imperial Irrigation District. And that uh, required federal legislation and appropriation of funds. Um, alongside all of this, there was a concern uh, as I mentioned earlier, of salinity delivered to California, being delivered to California. So I wrote a report on that issue, and uh, which I distributed to the uh, various other states and the United States, uh, that salinity control projects <clears throat> needed to be constructed, primarily in the upper basin so as to get better, uh, provide better water quality uh, to users in the lower basin states. For the sake of definition, uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, a salinity control project would prevent uh, saline water from entering the Colorado River, while a desalter would remove the saline uh, nature of the water. Uh, th that's the difference between the two. Right. And, and uh, on salinity control, we were looking at projects in the upper basin that would uh, line canals that cross very salt areas in the upper basin states, uh, take salt, salty springs and divert them away from the river. Uh, and 
number of different variety, wide variety of projects that could accomplish this purpose. So we saw the fact that the United States needed a, a bill for the uh, <clears throat> Mexican Treaty as a way to get the United States to be involved in this linear control. And we started by, uh, after my report came out, that was used as a basis to amend a, amend a federal appropriations bill to give the Bureau of Reclamation money to start studying projects of this nature. Do you remember the title of that uh, report and approximately what year it would have been published? No, I, I, it, again, it would be in the early 70s. I don't I remember the precise date. And the, the publisher would have been? Well, the report? Yes. Uh, would have been the Colorado River Board of California report. And, and then we got the money that the Bureau never asked for. and. Uh, but the, <clears throat> uh, they accepted it, and they appointed, uh, initially they left it to the uh, two regional directors of the Upper and Lower Colorado River Basin to commence the studies, and later on they provo uh, provided one person in Denver to handle that, Mike Clinton, who was involved in other activities later on. Uh, he was appointed to that job uh, to uh, coordinate the activities of the salinity control projects. But our legislation problem was this. The United States was not interested, the federal government was not interested in a salinity control project for the entire basin. But they wanted to get through a bill for the, uh, that would carry out the uh, Mexican Water Treaty uh, uh, Agreement. Uh, so their bill that they introduced was just covering that. We introduced the bill, the, when I say we, the, the states, seven states, that had that part of the bill as Title I and the Salinity Control uh, Projects as Title II. And I called up uh, Congressman Bill uh, Biz Johnson, who is chairman of the subcommittee, as I mentioned earlier, on the um, uh, uh, interior, interior Committee, House Interior Committee, and said, well, how is this going to work? He says, well, the way it's written now, the federal bill would go to the Foreign Affairs Committee. If it's written as you, uh, you've written the bill, uh, it would go to my committee. He says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll call up a congressman, I believe his name from New Jersey, named Dante Faselli. And he, he said he and I are good friends, and I'll ask him if he would uh, let it uh, come to our committee rather than to his committee. And that's what happened. And so with hearings before that, uh, the uh, Interior Committee, we were able to get the bill through uh, and passed by the Congress in 1974. And that bill uh, essentially provided the funding mechanism for salinity control? That's right. And that's, uh, with that bill, it became a much higher priority, with that act to be passed, it became a much higher priority for the Bureau of Reclamation. And they started moving on uh, <clears throat> investigating the projects in detail and starting few, several years later the funding of those projects. Would you like to talk a little bit about what what came to be known as the Yuma, as the Yuma DeSalter? You made reference to it earlier, uh, and of course, desalting water is an alternative to not allowing the salt in the water in the first place. The DeSalter was built; uh, it exists today, uh, hasn't been used much, and has been the subject of some scorn among. Many people and other people think it's quite an appropriate project. Uh, were you involved in any way in the discussions leading to its construction and/or operation? To some degree, this was the <coughs> decision that uh, came out of Brownell's uh, final report. Brownell took the position that he was not going to propose anything that would ham 
for any United States existing project. If you looked at it from a strictly financial point of view, it would have been much less expensive to just close down the central, uh, the Walton Mohawk project, buy out the project, buy out the, the uh, project, and just discontinue it. It would have been a lot cheaper than a desalting plant. But he made this commitment, and the Walton Mohawk uh, people depended upon that, and nothing else was proposed, and they went ahead and built it. Okay, uh, I think we can uh, then move ahead a little bit, uh, a little bit further. Uh, I want to remember, I want to remember that you joined the Metropolitan <coughs> Water District. I'm just trying to get a time frame here, and we'll go back. But you joined Metropolitan in uh, the late '80s. Uh, I, I forgot. <coughs> 1984. Okay, so the early '80s. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's, if we can then, uh, let's see if there's anything significant going on at the Colorado River Board uh, in your last several years there. So we're talking about roughly 78 to 84, uh, after, uh, after this, the uh, saline issue had been more or less resolved. And, uh, what, what other issues were uh, extent during those, say, those six years, 78 to 84? For. And anything worth covering, or was it more routine? Well, <clears throat> there was the rene renegotiation of the Hoover Power contracts. And, and these, uh, the original agreement that was made in the uh, 30s um, was a 50-year agreement. And that agreement uh, provided that the power from Hoover Dam would be split between the three basin uh, states in some fashion. And the three lower basin states. Lower basin states. And, uh, and that provided that the entire cost of the dam be repaid with uh, interest to the United States. And that funds would be, the repayment would come almost solely from the power contracts, and repaying those costs, the power contractors. And um, you had two state agencies that handled it for Nevada and Arizona. In California, you had uh, the uh, Department of Water and Power of the city of Los Angeles and the Southern California Edison Company, a private company, utility, uh, as the primary one. And then there were six smaller cities in California that also got uh, power allocations. So when the re renegotiations came up, um, each of the, uh, the two other states were represented by their power authorities. California, there wasn't any single power authority. There was a California Energy Commission and some other entity. But the, um, the power, uh, uh, California power entities didn't want them to represent them. They want to represent themselves. And as a state representative, they asked me to be, uh, be the uh, state representative and be the spokesman for these agencies. So we would meet uh, periodically and uh, develop positions and go to those uh, meetings and, and pr uh, present them. And then I also use that as an opportunity to get a small part of the new power rate to be used as funds for the salinity control project. Uh, the power utilities agreed reluctantly, but they finally agreed uh, to, I forget the amount, is a, a quarter of a mil, some, uh, some su such amount. Uh, so that was my interest, plus I was being their spokesman. Uh, for the purpose of the tape, I'm going to just define a quarter of a mil because some people might think you meant a quarter of a million. <laughs> uh, a mil being one tenth of a cent, and a quarter mil being 25 percent of one tenth of one cent. So we're not talking about a, a major chunk of money here. Right. It ended up being a lot enough, uh, a, a good sum, but in terms of cost to the utilities, that was a minor part. And. Uh, 
these were very uh, highly fought over uh, meetings and it attracted a lot of interest uh, from outside the participants. Uh, Barbara Boxer, who was then a congressman for Northern uh, California, introduced a bill without even discussing it with any of us that, that would have uh, priced the hour for the new contracts to be market value and with no recognition that the California entities that went into the 30s during the Depression and paid for power they never even received and uh, paid it off primarily. And then there was also a new construction of the generation uh, to be uh, included in any new bill. And as there was also a change in operation, the oper they'd been, Hoover Power Plant had been operated jointly by Southern California Edison and uh, Warren Power, and it was changed to be operated under the new agreement by the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, as far as my own involvement, I came to one meeting and presented a position that had been agreed to by the power agencies of California at an earlier meeting. And then uh, Norm Nichols, who represented the LA Department of Water Power, he was, uh, I think, assistant chief electrical engineer or some such position, had attended the meeting, agreed upon it, and then he got up and took issue with what I said came up with an entirely different proposal. And afterwards, I uh, went to him, I said, I thought we'd agreed on a position. He said, yeah. And I said, well, uh, why did you do this without even telling us? He said, I changed my mind. So at that point, I told the group that I would no longer represent them. They had better just represent their own positions as best they could. So that ended my involvement in that. Uh, particular uh, enterprise. I should point out that uh, Barbara Boxer, uh, who is from California's Bay Area, at the time of this interview is one of California's two United States Senators. Um, did you not get involved in the Hoover Power uh, negotiations when you moved over to MWD uh, from from MWD's standpoint, or was it done by that time? No, it wasn't done, but uh, Carl Bronke, who was general manager, had been heavily involved in it, and then others, so uh, there was really no need for me to get involved with it. Okay. Why do you uh, think, uh, now you and Carl uh, <coughs> went way back, and, and again, for the record, you have been uh, good friends for several decades that I know of, uh, but aside from that relationship, why do you think that Carl uh, recruited you to move from the Colorado River Board to Metropolitan Water District in 1984? Was there something specific on his mind that he was concerned about? Or uh, was he just looking for quality people at that time and had a great deal of confidence in you? I think the latter. He came to me and said uh, when he was applying, before he took the job, and he was still general counsel. He told me he was going to apply to be general manager, and if he got the job, he would need help, and he would like me to come in as assistant general manager. Uh, and, and he then recommended that I apply for the job myself. You mean the general manager yeah, job? Yeah, the general manager okay. job. He said that uh, most of the board members knew me, but a lot didn't know me. Uh, or at least some didn't know me. And he felt that if I applied for the position, then uh, I'd have an opportunity, assuming I got to the final the group that would be interviewed, that that, that would uh, give me an opportunity or give the, uh, to meet some of the board members and then for them to see me. Because <clears throat> the way it worked, uh, first of all, he told me they had never hired a, it, was, it was another nationwide search, or at least a, a nationwide search for a general manager, and Carl had applied and others. And he said they never had uh, hired a general manager from outside, and he doubted whether I'd get any place, but he f felt it would be useful in this uh, point to do that. 
And uh, I did get to be one of the six finalists, and then uh, Carl was selected. And then um, he came and he said, <laughs> I mean, one thing that brings my mind to our conversation, in which he said, now, you know, you've been your own boss for 16 years, and you come here, uh, I'll be your boss. He says, I don't think that's ever going to be a problem. He says, the way I look at it, if you and I have an issue, we'll discuss it until one of us convinces the other. And I assume you won't have a problem, but I want to be sure that you feel okay with that. And I said, yeah, that doesn't bother me at all. And I said, well, but one thing, he, I said, uh, to avoid any such uh, probability happening, always take my advice. <laughs> but, uh, and, but it was a, we had a terrific relationship. It worked out just like he said. And uh, I think he was right in having me come there and apply for it because uh, although the general manager recommends the appointment of an assistant general manager, it has to be approved by the entire board. Uh, so you were at Metropolitan Water District from 1984 until, uh, oh, help me, I, I don't 1990. Remember. 1990, so you were there for six years. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the major projects or public policy issues that, uh, that you worked on while you were at MWD, Metropolitan Water District? Well, I started uh, the first uh, negotiations with Imperial Irrigation District. Uh, this was on a transfer of water? No, well, not a transfer. It would have been involved uh, uh, conservation projects being constructed in the Imperial Valley that would save water and that we would pay for the conservation projects and get the benefit of any water, of the water saved. And um, that, that would have followed the, uh, the successful Elmore suit against IID and then ultimately the, I believe it was the State Water Resources Control Board uh, uh, convinced the, uh, the Imperial Irrigation District that they were wasting that water. I mean that, that's, a, that's a real Reader's Digest version of that whole event, but, but is that not what prompted uh, Imperial to open up those conversations and, and talk to MWD? Yeah, that's, uh, that's essentially it. The, uh, they were under considerable pressure as to uh, them being accused of wasting water. And hearings were actually held before the State Water Resources Control Board on this issue. So we started negotiating with, with Imperial, and they had a, a committee that consisted of their, uh, two of their five board members, their general manager and their general counsel. And initially there were Carl and I and, and uh, Bob Shemp that were involved in this issue. Uh, although I'm not sure Shemp was involved the first time around. But anyhow, uh, it took us a year to arrive at an agreement for 100,000 acre feet of water, which would cost uh, about $10 million a year. Uh, and that was the essence of the agreement that we arrived at. And uh, Imperial invited me to their board meeting where they're going to approve it. We knew that uh, we had the two board members who were part of the negotiating team in favor of the agreement. And we knew we had one other board member that was in favor of it. And we knew the other two might most likely would oppose it. But they felt they had it in hand, and we sat there. Well, I sat there, and I had, uh, I was <clears throat> with uh, others, and it came down to 2-2, two -two, and finally to the member who was one of the two members of the negotiating team, and he voted no. And then later, I went up to see him. I, I said, what happened? And uh, he was a man of about 72 at that time. And he said he got calls from several farmers in his district that were opposed to it. And he was going to run for re-election next time, and he felt that uh, 
he had a vote against it to be assure his re-election. So uh, who who are we to, who who are we talking about here? Which I can't there? remember his name. Blocked it out. Okay. And, <laughs> and uh, so that ended that part of it, and then uh, nothing happened for some time, and then at that point, San Diego. Uh, County Water Authority uh, started to try negotiations with Imperial. And uh, our top management uh, felt that uh, was not right for them to try and do it. And we pressed it with the board and uh, pointed out the problems. We went down to uh, San Diego County Water Authority and talked to their board members about how this was not the right thing to do. And under pressure, uh, they finally backed off and then entered into another uh, negotiating session with Imperial. And this agreement was, was more specific in that we identified specific projects to be built. And uh, the estimated the cost of each of these projects, estimated the amount of water that would be saved by each of them, and ended up with a uh, agreement for approximately the same amount of water, 100,000 acre feet a year, enough to serve uh, half a million households uh, at that time. Who, would, who was the general manager at Imperial at this time? Well, the earlier time was, I think, Bob Carter. Second time around, it was, uh, oh, I forgot his name. Was it Chuck Shree? Chuck Shree's, right. Yeah, Chuck Shree, John Carter was the attorney. And uh, you had initially John Benson as one of the board members that was on it. And was Don and, Cox on the board at that time? Uh, I think the second time around he was, but he was not on the negotiating committee. Uh, so we finally did that, and then it took another year to no negotiate uh, agreements with Coachella Water District and Palo Verde Irrigation District uh, since they along with Imperial and Metropolitan are the four agencies uh, that have the contracts with the federal government and <clears throat> so we had to get their concurrence uh, and we had to give up uh, some rights to Coachella under certain conditions of drought Palo Verde, we settle without anything specific for them. Uh, for uh, rather than go into it here, uh, for anyone interested in uh, learning about how that water flows from agency to agency, uh, starting with the ag agencies, uh, you would refer a researcher to the six agency agreement, or or what other documentation might they take a look at so that they understand the priority system uh, from Palo Verde to Imperial to Coachella and whatnot? Yeah, it would, it would be in the contracts that the Secretary of Interior signed with the four agencies that I just mentioned. Okay, would it also be located though within the, uh, what has come to be known as a six agency agreement or, or no, am I giving Am I giving you a bad direction here? No, it, it would be, you'd have to look at the contracts. Okay. All right. Um, f uh, again, for uh, just historical note, uh, this tape is being made at the end of December 2002 at a very time when uh, Imperial Irrigation District uh, has been negotiating with the San Diego County Water Authority, Metropolitan, and Coachella over yet another transfer, a different transfer than the one you're talking about. And uh, uh, they would, uh, they have, in fact, as of this date, reached an impasse uh, that has become quite newsworthy and is worth uh, any researcher's attention to look into that. Uh, while I'm on that subject, Myron, uh, any thoughts on the on the current uh, state of negotiations between and among those agencies? I mean, you you've read the newspaper articles and you certainly have a sense of what's going on. What are, what are your thoughts about? The well, impasse. It's a deja vu all over again. I read it. Uh, it was supposed to be three to two, and uh, one member voted against it. It was supposed to be four. And of course, in this case, 
it's an agreement between the uh, San Diego County Water Authority and Imperial, not between Metropolitan and, and Imperial. So uh, Metropolitan apparently uh, allowed uh, San Diego to, to negotiate for this water rather than pursuing it themselves for some reason. Were you involved in the negotiations with Palo Verde Irrigation District in a pilot uh, program several years ago where Metropolitan uh, went in for just a one-year period, I believe it was, and uh, uh, primarily it was a fallowing program. And, and I don't recall whether you were involved in that or not. Well, I was involved in starting the work that led up to that. We, uh, we started, uh, we talked to their board of directors and we assign uh, several members of our staff to interview every farmer in Palo Verde Valley and talk to them about how they felt about a Fowling program. And then we also talked to the uh, uh, Palo Verde city officials, what, what they would think about that. And we, uh, we started, developed a program that would be following and included in that program would be money that would be uh, given to the city to compensate them in some in some fashion for their uh, any loss of uh, of income doing do any fouling program. These are the third party impacts. Yeah, that, it would uh, it would be involved in that, and basically it did all the groundwork. Although at that time we didn't feel we needed a fouling program quite yet, but that was accomplished uh, after I left. Okay. Uh, what else during your tenure at Metropolitan uh, with regard to the Colorado River comes to mind? Uh, well, I think <clears throat> what we discussed uh, with respect to the Colorado River uh, essentially was involved in the issues we just talked about. Okay. Well, let's uh, spend a little bit of time then, uh, just uh, uh, seeing if we can get on tape uh, recollections that you might have uh, about some of the uh, significant people, uh, yourself included, frankly, uh, but some of the significant people that you had to deal with uh, on Colorado River issues over the years. Maybe you can give us just a real quick snapshot of, of what kind of people they were to deal with and, and how influential they were or were not. And I'll, I'll just start with one name. I'll, I'll pick with uh, Mike Ely, uh, who you dealt with. Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, Mike uh, was the lead attorney in California v. Arizona, uh, Arizona v. California. And he maintained, I think probably to his dying day in the 90s, his, he, he died in his early 90s, that uh, California won the lawsuit. Uh, he and uh, his assistant, but uh, California lost the lawsuit, no matter what he said. Um, How, uh, I, I guess where I'm trying to go, Myron, is uh, uh, what, how were these people to work with uh, I mean, are, are we are we talking about uh, people that some might define as giants in, in the water biz on the Colorado River? Or uh, I, I have heard some people describe, especially uh, Mike Ely, in in that fashion. Uh, is that is that not right? Uh, well, I think uh, everybody had a lot of problems on the California side working with Mike Ely. Ray Matthew, who was the first chief engineer, and Dal Cole, and then later myself. Uh, Mike uh, was not well liked on the on the Hill and in, in, con in Congress. A lot of congressmen didn't like him because he he simply never wanted to negotiate. He always stuck whatever his position, and he wouldn't compromise. And I had a lot of problems with him. And. Uh, uh, one example was after I appointed chief engineer, I got a call from Morris Udall, who was an Arizona congressman, who along with John Rhodes of Arizona, who was minority leader for Republican of Arizona, were the two key Arizona 
officials involved in the Colorado River Basin Project Act. And um, so I came over, and he said, don't bring Ely with you. And I went to see him, and we discussed some of the issues, and when I came back, uh, and Mike, uh, uh, I guess I told him I'd seen Ely, and I told Ely that I saw you, Dom. And he said, how could you go without me? And I said, uh, that's my decision, whether I have you or not. You're an advisor. If I want you, I'll ask you. If I don't, I won't. And uh, I walked out and went down to catch my uh, airline bus to go home. And he, later, while I was waiting there, he followed down and came to me and said, we got to get along. Let's, not, let's be friends and all that. But uh, I had bad experience. A week, uh, I went to Washington. And I had set up appointments with Assistant Secretary of Interior, Under Secretary of Interior, head of Bureau of Reclamation, and invited Mike to those meetings. And the first meeting, he starts out talking about a Nevada client that he had on our time, my, uh, my time there. And he did some other thing I want to go into with each one. And I, I came back and uh, well, I think earlier I'd recommended that the six agency committee not use them any, didn't need them. And everyone agreed except LA Water and Power. And I met with their general manager and general counsel. And they had him on a separate retainer, and they did not want to see him go. And I explained the problems I'd have, which are a lot more than I just described. And <laughs> I remember this very clearly. Farrell, Ed Farrell, who was the general counsel for Water and Power, said, Myron, you got to recognize he's an old man. He was in his early 70s at the time and was active until his 90s. So you got to make allowances for that. Well, Ely was not an old man. He was a very active man in, in his 70s. But after this experience in Washington, I came back and I told the six agency committee, that they could pay him if they wanted to, but I was not going to use him anymore. And then at that point, LA Water and Power went along with it, and they discontinued their uh, agreement with him. Okay, well, let's see if a couple of other names uh, have any meaning, and, and you don't, you know, if they don't, they don't, and that's fine. Uh, how about uh, Lowell Weeks? Uh, well, Lowell was a very active, uh, participant in Colorado River issues, and uh, he's a guy who uh, had a lot of good ideas and was a very uh, good spokesman for his agency, and, and uh, I liked him, we got along well. His agency was the? Coachella Valley Water District. Uh, how about uh, Virgil Jones? Uh, Virgil was outstanding. He was a layman, farmer. But he's one of these individuals that's capable of grasping the essence of any situation and coming up with very good uh, common sense ideas. And he's a perfect, perfect board member. Uh, you mentioned Mike Clinton earlier working out of Denver on the salinity issue, but Mike also ultimately was general manager at Imperial Irrigation District. Did you have any dealings with him when he held that position? No, but earlier in that, <clears throat> after I retired, I became a consultant to the firm of Bookman and Edmondson. And uh, Mike was a vice president of the firm at that time. And I worked with him on a couple projects. Um, and his dad, of course, again for the historical record, his father, Frank Clinton, was a general manager at Metropolitan Water District uh, in its earlier days. It would have been in the early 1950s. 50s? Is yeah. that right? Well, <clears throat> I met uh, uh, his father uh, when he was general manager. I, when I was a, um, with my consulting firm, I was a consultant to the Kern County Water Agency in negotiating a contract, a state water contract. And to, <clears throat> to get our contract the way we wanted, we had to negotiate with Metropolitan Water District because they signed the first contract and we needed some changes to get the agricultural agency in. Now that's when I met uh, his father. Okay. Um, 
Tom Levy, did you uh, work with Tom at all? Tom, yes. general manager at Coachella following Lowell. And Tom was another outstanding person. Coachella really picked good general managers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the people that worked for you uh, became commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, a fellow by the name of Dennis Underwood. Uh, how did that work for for you? What did you? Uh, what I mean by that, I guess, is that at one point Dennis worked for you. Uh, if I have the sequence incorrect, you joined Metropolitan Water District, and Dennis moved up into your position at the Colorado River Board. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Uh, eventually, but the <coughs> the first. Uh, person who followed me was my assistant Vern Valentine okay. and he had the job for I think a year and a half and then Dennis was appointed. Okay and then Dennis went from from that job with Colorado River Board to Commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation. Yes. Did you have occasion to work with him? Uh, you were at MWD and he was at the Bureau? Right. I met with him a couple of times when he had that position. And uh, how, how would you describe working with, with Dennis, who, who is now uh, rejoined, or, well, that's not correct, who has now joined Metropolitan Water District as uh, uh, vice president in charge of Colorado River issues? Uh, well, Den Dennis was excellent. He uh, uh, appointed him to be executive secretary. The previous uh, executive secretary uh, had, uh, was not an engineer. He handled the non-engineering uh, work of the board. But uh, Dennis was uh, recommended to me by Ernie Weber, who was part of the board staff and had previously been with the Department of Water Resources, and said that Dennis was a very outstanding person. And I interviewed him, and I felt it would be a, a bonus I get someone who could handle the non-engineering uh, matters that, as well as being involved in engineering matter. And Dennis was a workaholic, uh, and he was an outstanding employee. Were there other commissioners with whom you worked that stand out in your mind, uh, one way or the other? Yeah, of course, there was Floyd Dominey, who had the uh, job for years. And um, I forget the name of his successors, but uh, I was involved in dealing with uh, all the, commission, the commissioners of the Bureau of Reclamation. And uh, also, primarily, more so, with the, uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, district regional directors of the Upper Colorado River uh, District and uh, the Lower Colorado River District of the Bureau of Reclamation. Okay. Uh, before we leave the subject of people, is there anyone else that comes to your mind uh, that you worked with who uh, was significant in setting the, the course of the Colorado River? Well, I worked very closely with Wes Steiner uh, when he was in California and also when he was uh, uh, with uh, uh, Arizona. And uh, uh, we cooperated uh, very well, uh, even though we had different responsibilities. And then uh, the Upper Basin States, people that I mentioned earlier, they were outstanding, uh, too, uh, many of them. Uh, Steve Reynolds from New Mexico, Larry Sparks uh, from Colorado. Uh, uh, Larry was uh, also the... Uh, general in charge of the uh, National Guard for the state of Colorado. And uh, he was a colonel and uh, fought with uh, General Patton's army all through uh, Germany in World War II. Ivo Goslin, who was the uh, executive director for the Upper Colorado River Commission, was someone I worked with uh, for many years. That was outstanding. Uh, if you look back on your career uh, on the Colorado River, or dealing with Colorado River issues, is there one moment, and maybe it's a moment we've already talked about, 
but I, I want to highlight it if it's there. Is there one moment or one thing or one project that stands out in your mind as being uh, truly significant in terms of how the river is operated today? Well, I think it would go back to uh, October 1968 when uh, I shook President uh, Johnson's hand in the White House and he signed the Colorado River Basin Project Act. And he was interesting in that he brought Lady Bird there. And there were maybe uh, I don't know, 70, 80 people, uh, senators, congressmen, state representatives, interior uh, heads. And he said he thinks it was about the no more than the second day, he, he was a United States Senator, that Senators from Arizona and Nevada approached him, I'm sorry, Arizona and California approached him to give their version of the state's rights and to get his support then. So he remembered that very well. And he, uh, uh, he was outstanding, really charismatic, which uh, I, I never saw on television, but seeing him personally, and when you shook his hand and he looked down on you, at least he looked down on me because of his size, you could see how he got the reputation of putting the arm on other United States senators when he was majority leader and getting them to say yes. With an appreciation for the fact that you probably did not have time to get into an extended conversation with the President of the United States. The fact is that he was from Texas, and Texas shares some of the same uh, United States-Mexico issues uh, that California and the other basin states share with Mexico. Uh, was he aware of that, or did that ever come up? Or, uh, I, I, would have, I would have thought that that would be a hot issue in Texas, which is uh, his state. And I'm just curious as to whether he was aware of that. Well, as you said, you don't have time to uh, talk about anything, but Texas did have an impact, strong impact, on the uh, 1944 treaty between the United States and Mexico, because at that time, Senator Tom Connolly uh, from Texas was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And he was interested in getting a treaty in the Rio Grande. And he got it so that the treaty uh, involved the Rio Grande, Colorado, uh, included the Rio Grande as well as the Tijuana rivers, which was thrown in in Colorado. And the essence of it was that. Uh, I believe Mexico got less in the Rio Grande and more in the Colorado than uh, they deserve, but less on the Rio Grande than they deserve. And that's uh, kind of a general summation. If, uh, well, let me, I'll give you one more opportunity just in case you thought of anyone. And if you didn't, that's fine. I'm not trying to pull names out of the hat here that uh, don't have any particular significance to you. But before I move on, uh, is there anyone else uh, in your career uh, with regard to the river that we should have talked about? Or? Yeah, we should have talked about Don Mon. Okay. I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, I took his place in the Colorado River Board. And uh, he went on to have an outstanding career. He uh, uh, first worked for, as I mentioned earlier, on this Western Water Planning Unit of the Department of Water Resources. And then he was appointed to a, a federal position on a, uh, uh, a water, uh, water commission, United States Water Commission, I forget the exact name of it. And then he came back to California and was, we, was uh, appointed uh, by the governor to be on the State Water Resource Control Board and he later became chairman. And uh, he was a paraplegic. Uh, he was confined to a wheelchair, but you would never know it. I mean, he was just a, he, he would do everything. He would, uh, you know, he, he would require help, but uh, nothing would stop him from participating in everything. And uh, he was just an outstanding individual as, as well as a very capable uh, water resources expert.
And at the time of this interview, he is a member of the Metropolitan Water District. Uh, oh, we're talking about a different Don person? Don Juan. Uh, no, Don Juan Don. Well, who am I thinking of? I don't know. I'll take this off the tape. Okay. Don? You're, th you're not thinking of this guy, Don from Orange County, yeah. are you? Yeah. No, this is Maughan, M-A-U-G-H-A-N. He was principal engineer of the Colorado. He, he had the spot that I took over when I joined the Colorado River. Well, you, you, never, you never knew him on a, wheel, in a wheelchair. You never knew Don Maughan, I guess. You, wouldn't, you would have remembered him if you saw him. He was chairman of the State Water Resource and Control Board. Maybe that was before he... You, no, you would have been. No, that, I would have been there. You would have been at Metropolitan at the time. He was appointed, let's see, Reagan was governor. Okay, for purposes of the transcriber, uh, we took a short break there, and uh, we're back. And uh, uh, Myron, I think maybe I'll just throw out a few names here, and, and, and you can just give us a a sentence or two uh, on them and their importance on the river. Uh, Ray Romans? Well, Ray Romans was uh, chairman of the board, Colorado River Board, uh, in, through my entire career, uh, some 19 years with the board. And uh, he was just always very helpful, very supportive, and an excellent guy. Ray represented uh, Coachella Valley right. Water District. Uh, Carl Bevins? Yeah, Carl was the uh, imperial representative that uh, was uh, very active and important uh, uh, person. And then we had Joe Jensen from the earlier from the uh, Metropolitan uh, Water District, and uh, uh, he was heavily involved in activities. Uh, you had a f couple of people that worked for you at the Colorado River Board, uh, Ernie and Vern, who uh, certainly made contributions. Uh, That's right. They, they, they both did. Ernie Weber did uh, all the technical work and, uh, for the Salinity Control Program. Uh, he and there's Ron Hightower who did a lot of the work uh, uh, as a supervising engineer. And. Uh, I think Vern, you, you already talked a little bit about Vern Valentine, who followed you as uh, executive in charge. Yeah, well, one of my first things that I did on the, the board was hire him to take over my spot as assistant chief engineer. And uh, worked with him uh, through my entire career there at Metropolitan. A very bright guy, and, and I caught on very quickly to anything that we were involved in. Uh, after you moved over to Metropolitan Water District, what uh, what do you think your influence was with regard to MWD's staff at that time? Well, I did uh, quite a bit of reorganization on uh, my primary responsibilities of uh, uh, <coughs> water supply, and the state water project, and the uh, Colorado River uh, uh, water supply, and any activities relating to that. And, I created some new uh, uh, sections. I created a Colorado River section so that we could have one section that just focus uh, primarily on the Colorado River. And uh, Bob Shemp was head of that, and Jan Matusek was uh, outstanding in the, the work uh, that uh, he did. He was hired from the Department of Water Resources that came over to a Metropolitan. Uh, maybe slightly before I got there, or just after I got there. And, uh, and Wiley Horn, I uh, promoted him to uh, be a director of uh, planning uh, activities. And <clears throat> I got uh, Tim Quinn to join the uh, board. Uh, and that was an interesting... Uh, you said uh, board, I think I'm you mean I'm sorry, uh, Metropolitan Water District. Uh, he's, Tim's an economist, and he was an economist at Rand Corporation. And the <clears throat> uh, Pasadena representative, who at that time uh, worked at Caltech, uh, met with me and uh, Carl and then told me about Tim Quinn, that I should talk to him and he could recommend an economist because the one that we had had recently resigned. And I said, well, what about him? He said, oh, well, you'll never get him to leave Rand. He's, uh, he's on his track to be a very important person uh, there at Metropolitan, I mean at the Rand. So I took Tim uh, 
and talk to him and ask him about joining uh, uh, Metropolitan. I told him, you know, you could stay at Rand and uh, write reports, uh, research reports that will gather dust on uh, someone's desk. Uh, or you could join Metropolitan and be really involved in uh, what happens to uh, providing a water supply for Southern California. And it took me two or three lunches to convince him. He later claims that I never took him to lunch after he joined. <laughs> I don't think he's right, but that was one of his statements to me. And uh, there are a number of others that were appointed and that they rose to uh, top position in Metropolitan or later managed uh, various water district uh, in Southern California. So I'm very proud of the people that uh, I recruited for Metropolitan. Um, I think we'll, we'll draw this to a close. If something comes to your mind in the next few minutes, please just say it. But I will close it with one final question, and that is, if you were talking directly to someone who is doing research on the Colorado River, and it's the year 2040 or 2050, or sometime in the future, uh, what publications or books or authors, if any, would you suggest uh, they take a look at, uh, I mean, th there are, at this moment in time, there have been any number of uh, books written about water, water issues in the West, uh, but there are probably also reports uh, and other things that you may be familiar with. Uh, but what, what comes to your mind that is in the way of published material that someone might want to take a look at? Uh. Well, I guess one of the first things that come, uh, that come to mind is a professor at uh, UCLA, history professor, whose name escapes me. He and, he and I jointly wrote a report for a uh, water atlas that was put out by the state of California during the uh, Jerry Brown administration. Is that the document that Bill Carl edited? That's right. Okay, uh, I can find the, the name will be in there. I'll, yeah. I'll find that for you. Uh, he did a lot of research uh, on the Mexican Water Treaty and other uh, Colorado River issues. And he, uh, uh, he wrote quite extensively. And I think uh, his book comes to mind. Okay, and his material would be contained within the UCLA Water Archives. Uh, is yes. that a fair assumption? Yes. Um, offhand, I can't think of uh, any um, any articles. I I wrote a lot of uh, articles. Uh, one was published on salinity in the New Mexico Law Review. Most of the others were uh, presented in chapters of various books that I can't think the name of and. Uh, I think you just have to look up the Colorado River and follow it through, but uh, don't avoid reading the basic documents. The I basic think, documents being yeah. the treaty, uh, the, the, 19 Boulder, the Boulder Canyon uh, Project Act, the, uh, uh, the 1922 compact between the seven states, the Upper Basin uh, Colorado River Compact, uh, uh, the uh, hearings relative in the 1965-68 uh, uh, Colorado River Basin Project Act and the Salinity Control Act, all, all those uh, have uh, information and testimony uh, and uh, material that was submitted in connection with those, uh, uh, those uh, hearings. And the, uh, <clears throat> the lawsuit itself, uh, the Arizona v. California lawsuit and the uh, court's the uh, final decision and other aspects of uh, that issue. Okay, perfect. Uh, uh, unless there's anything else that you want to make sure that we get down, uh, we'll call that the end of the interview. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.